promised, uh, today's second debate will focus on the ethical issues surrounding judges returning to practice, which is particularly interesting today because we have among us two judges who have returned to practice, one from the Ontario Court of Appeal, one from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, so, so we get two votes. So yeah, you, you get two votes automatically. Uh, so uh, we're, we're very excited to have uh, today's debaters uh, here with us today. Allow me to introduce them. Uh, first, yet another pal of mine appearing uh, on a panel. Um, I have two Stevens to introduce, one of them honorable. Um, and, uh, <laughs> oh, he won't say which. <laughs> Uh, Professor Patel is one of Canada's foremost scholars in conflict of laws. He's also well known in the fields of tort and legal ethics. He joined the Faculty of Law in 2000 after practicing corporate and commercial litigation in Toronto and completing his graduate studies at the University of Cambridge. He was promoted to full professor in 2013. He's the co-author of a whole lot of books that I won't bother mentioning by name right now because you mostly know him and all of his books are listed on uh, his faculty biography on our website. Uh, he was awarded the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Association's Teaching Award in 2013 and the Edward Pleva Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2012, the Bank of Nova Scotia University of Western Ontario Alumni Association and University Students Council Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching in 2008, and Western Law Student Legal Society Professor of the Year Award in both 2004 and 2008. He's a member of the Chief Justice of Ontario's Advisory Committee on Professionalism and a member of the Executive Committee of the Tort Law Research Group. Please join me in welcoming Professor Patel. Our other guest this morning is the Honorable Stephen Gouge, a leader in Canada's legal community, having served as a Justice of the Ontario Court of Appeal from 1996 until his recent retirement from the bench. He holds degrees from the University of Toronto and the London School of Economics, as well as an honorary doctorate from the Law Society of Upper Canada. He was called to the bar in 1970 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 1982. He was managing partner of Gowling, Strathy and Henderson in Toronto, where he engaged in a general litigation practice and appeared before all levels of court in Canada. He's been a lecturer in both labor law and Aboriginal rights and was a venture of the Law Society from 1991 until his appointment to the Ontario Court of Appeal. And then, after years of distinguished service on that court, he returned to practice. He became counsel to Pallia Rowland in 2014. Please join me in welcoming the honor. who I note prefers to be called Stephen. Um, this morning's resolution is the following, be it resolved that in order to ensure the highest possible ethical standards and to avoid the appearance of impropriety, judges who retire from the bench should be prohibited from returning to practice. Arguing for this resolution, you can guess, is Professor Stephen Patel. Arguing against the resolution is the Honorable Stephen Gouch. Thank you very much. Rand, thank you very much for that, uh, in particular for that very kind Introduction. I, this debate, I suspect, I'm just guessing, but I suspect will feature slightly less profanity than the previous uh, <laughs> debate. Uh, perhaps it, only on my end. I, I can't speak for my <laughs> uh, so the, the question we're looking at here is, of course, should retired judges be allowed to return to the practice of law? And it may surprise uh, some of you to know that the current status quo answer is yes, that retired judges can, in fact, return to the practice of law. They can do so in all provinces in Canada, and they can do so the very next day after they retire. The only restriction that is placed on them is a time-limited prohibition regarding certain appearances before certain courts. But subject to that, which expires, as I say, because it's time-limited, there's no barrier in Canadian law for judges retiring and then returning directly to practice. Historically, this raised almost no concern because it didn't happen very often. Historically, judges actually, when they retired, you know, they retired. They played golf or bridge or shuffleboard or whatever it was one does when one retires. And there was no question about the idea of uh, heading back to the salt mines of, of private practice. And yet today, that's exactly what is happening and with considerable increasing frequency. So a majority now of former Supreme Court of Canada judges on retiring join law firms. Um, Ian Binney, who's with us today, is an example of that. He's now at Leinster Slat in Toronto. Uh, and from the appellate courts, we are seeing this phenomenon. The provincial appellate courts, Stephen Gouge, again, right here, is a classic example of that. Um, one day, he's across the street at Osgood Hall, um, cleaning out his office and rend rendering his last judgment. And so the next day, he's across the street uh, at Pelair Rowan. So my proposed contention today is that this just shouldn't be happening. Right? That we've entered some sort of alternate weird reality where we set this concept now, once we're alert to it and it snuck up on us, we should emphatically put our foot down and say, these judges, once they retire from the bench, should not be allowed to return to practice. Um, I haven't made that position up. That's the position in England, 
right? So there's a precedential jurisdiction out there that knows something or you know, one or two things about how the common law operates and how a legal system operates, and its position is this shouldn't happen. My contention is that should be <coughs> our position. What do we mean? There's a couple of uh, parametric uh, aspects to this. Uh, I, won't, I won't do Alice's definition within a definition stuff, but a little bit of discussion about what we mean by returning to practice. There are, of course, many ways to return to the practice of law after ceasing to be a judge. And I would accept, perhaps a little begrudgingly, that very few problems would be raised by a former judge who now wants to adopt a nice, quiet wills and estates practice or do some real estate conveyancing. But this is not in reality what retired judges want to do when they think about a return to practice. Very few of them, for example, have any background or expertise in wills, estates, or real estate conveyancing, and hardly unretiring want to take that up. What they want to do is practice litigation. They want to go back into the milieu of litigation. And so precluding that is the focus of my argument. Um, to, to respond to that by arguing that ex-judges should be able to do wills and estate work um, really misses the reality of the issue. We may as well argue that those ex-judges should also be allowed to go out and breed unicorns. Right? It's just not in practice what's actually uh, at issue in, in the debate. I am also, less begrudgingly, willing to concede that there should be a small, very discretionary, very limited exception for judges to be allowed to return to practice in very unusual circumstances. So, someone who manages to somehow get appointed a judge and a month in decides this is a terrible job and leaves ceasing, and ceases to be a judge after only a very short period of time on the bench. And it has happened. Right? We do have at least one or two examples where exactly that has happened. I'd accept that those people um, could return to practice, um, but, but not beyond that. All right, what are the arguments? What's the contention? Well, the first argument is the judges have absolutely, positively, no need to do this. There is no practical case in favor of allowing this. Um, it, I may have to whisper this, but judges are quite well paid, right? They have, they have an index pension. Um, they get to work right up to 75 at that rate of pay. Um, they get to start drawing on their pension even while they continue to work. And if that sounds cool, it really is. Right? It's a very cool <laughs> process. Um, judges are clearly part of the 1%. Right? If we're throwing around labels about sort of social levels and all that sort of stuff, um, they're not in the Devlin, low Ireland kind of bracket. You know, right? they're, in the, they're in the 1% here. Uh, unless, of course, Devlin becomes a judge. And then, of course, he, he will also join that. Um, but that's, that's kind of in the unicorn category. Right? <laughs> um, secondly, uh, there's no shortage of qualified lawyers who are willing and eager to do the legal work that judges would take up when they return to practice. So judges can't make the argument that in their retirement they are somehow filling a labor gap or shortage um, that desperately needs to be filled. That is not the nature of the work that judges are doing or expressing interest in doing. Uh, judges, moreover, have the opportunity, if they insist on working at all after retiring, they have the opportunity to do other things, right? They could conduct mediations, they could serve as arbitrators, they could serve on commissions, they could serve on boards, and none of that work, which is also quite lucrative, right? none of that work requires returning to practice. So all of those avenues, it's not like I want judges to be destitute in the street, after they retire, there are lots of things that judges could do that make a meaningful contribution to our society that do not involve a return to practice. And the final point related to just this practical argument is um, it's not like we sprung this on the judges, right? The deal, certainly under the English model, the deal is when you accept the appointment, you understand that when you cease to be a judge, you will then be precluded from going back to practice. So if that's the deal, if that's the arrangement, if that's part of the quid pro quo, it's hardly unfair. So, if judges don't need to do this, my second line of argument then is allowing it to happen, far from being a neutral phenomena, actually raises very significant concerns about the administration of justice in this country. Now, not in, in fairness, not all aspects of judges returning to practice raise those concerns, or the same level of concerns. But as we will see, the problem is that the lines are blurry, that they are difficult to draw or appreciate, they make it very difficult for us to draft rules that we could enforce to deal with judges who return to practice. And given that, given the downsides, given the problems, given the regulatory difficulty, the more sensible solution, I contend, is a complete bar. Well, what are, O oh, Patel, what are these concerns about administration of justice? Well, some of them concern appearances in courts. 
So, I'll give you the example of Charles Huband. Charles Huband was on the Manitoba Court of Appeal for 27 years. He retired. He waited his short cooling off period. And then he went right back to arguing appeals in front of that court. In front of his former colleagues on that court. He is now, by the way, for those keeping count, 4-0, not surprisingly, arguing appeals in front of the Manitoba Court of Appeal. Try explaining that to the losing side of an appeal in that court, right? How do we as a system accept that that somehow doesn't raise concerns about the administration of justice? This is particularly a problem in jurisdictions with small appellate courts. How many judges are on the Prince Edward Island Court of Appeal? Three. Right? So if you retire from that court and you're allowed to go back and argue in front of your two former colleagues and your replacement, you're dealing with a very small legal community. Whether it's true or not, and I think in many ways it is true, but whether it's true or not is somewhat apart from the point. The public perceives that judges have a special status, that they exert a special influence over the legal system, and they would perceive that an ex-judge carries with him or her that influence in making submissions before current judges, and that influence, in my view, is improper. In addition, an ex-judge is likely to have various information on a personal level about his or her former colleagues. And even if that's not true, and I think it is true, the public will perceive it to be true. Right? The optics are that they will think, for example, that Stephen Gouge might know what kind of argument Justice Feldman or Justice Sharp like or dislike when submissions are being made in front of their courts. Judges are, that we have to sometimes think hard through it, work our way through it, judges are human too. Right? So they carry with them the same sorts of uh, emotional baggage or attitudes uh, or predilections that all of us uh, do. The further problem with appearances raises some absurd scenarios. Right? So we could have a scenario where a judge decides a case at the first instance level, retires, waits out the cooling off period, and then appears as counsel <coughs> to argue on the appeal, contending that the lower decision, his or her own, is correct. Right? And if you think that's somehow acceptable, and I don't, our rules also allow the judge to appear and make exactly the opposite argument, <laughs> and argue that, oh, boy, the motions judge really screwed this up, Right? The, the ex-judge now as counsel can take a run at his or her own decision. That can't be right. That can't be acceptable. In addition, we have concerns that go beyond appearances in court. One of these, again, is a destabilization problem. There is no meaningful way to a police what we mean by appearances. Sure, we know that if Stephen Gouge walks into the Court of Appeal and starts making submissions, he's appearing. We know that if he signs a factum, he's appearing in writing. But what about other lawyers at his firm going into his office and picking his brain, metaphorically, to get information about a case that they're doing in front of his former colleagues? What about his offering suggestions or input on written materials without actually signing them? Right? So we destabilize the note. If we try to think we can handle this just by regulating appearances in proceedings, we learn pretty quickly that there are, there's conduct on the edge of appearances largely that would go undetected and is largely unpoliceable, but raises every bit the same kinds of concerns. The public perception would be <coughs> that lawyers within a firm are sharing information and are sharing confidences. Indeed, the public perception, I expect, would be that's why these law firms have hired gentlemen like these. Right? It can't just be for their colorful and sparkling personalities. Right? There's a reason they want them in the firm. Right? <laughs> There's a reason they want them in the office. Another problem. Uh, Ex-judges have the ability to use their prior status as judges to attract clients. Right? They have an advertising advantage. So, Michelle Basterash at Heaton Blakey ran magazine ads that told potential clients that if they had an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, he, in particular, could be of assistance because he and his juniors, who were former clerks of that court, knew the system. Right? They were former insiders in that system. And now, as a lawyer, you're saying, here, come to me. I used to be on that court. 
The public, again, this furthers the notion that the public would be led to believe that this former judge has special influence and exerts a special degree of control in submissions before that court. That's unseemly, and it lowers our respect for the judicial system. We have further problems, right? We have the disclosure of inside information through other aspects of one's practice, even if one doesn't go near the courts at all. So a former judge could offer an opinion to a client as to what his or her former court might do in a case similar to one that it heard when he or she was a member of that court. And the former judge might, in a very colloquial way, be able to say, well, I was at the council table, I was at the conference table in the, in the meeting room when we argued about what the parameters of that earlier case were. It's not in the reported decision, but I was in the room. And I can now use that information to predict or guess what the court might do in a subsequent case. A judge, by virtue of being a judge, comes to learn a whole slew of things that are subject to confidentiality, or should be, because there is actually no written confidentiality requirement imposed on either sitting or former judges by the Canadian Judicial Council. And so there's a significant risk and a public perception concern that that information could get misused <coughs> by the ex-judge for the benefit of one client and the detriment of another. And the final point that, that I would raise uh, related to this is that allowing judges to return to practice compromises our overall perception of judicial neutrality. Right? It's very hard for the public to appreciate that a person could be scrupulously neutral one day, and then metaphorically by moving one's desk across Queen Street West, zealously partisan the next day on behalf of individual clients. That casts doubt in our collective mind as to whether the judge, while judge, truly was neutral. Right? It, it raises questions. It's so easy to switch in and out of neutrality to partisanship. That raises concerns, optic system concerns, about whether there's real neutrality um, in the institution um, itself. So, uh, are all of those concerns of equal magnitude or weight? No. But collectively, there's a lot there that raises concerns about the administration of justice. And the cumulative weight of these concerns are such that they can't easily be finessed away by more detailed rules, and our solution has to be an absolute preclusion. England, I'll return to where I started. England has recently looked at changing its rule and decided against. The English system concluded that allowing a return to practice by former judges would diminish the standing of the judiciary, would seriously weaken its independence, and would give rise to ongoing concerns about perceived possible bias and conflict. Thank you. Thanks, Rand, for the introduction, and uh, this is a fun topic that uh, I don't think has received enough scrutiny in, uh, in the world of uh, legal ethics, and I suspect in the future that will be cured. Uh, there is only one seminal article in Canada that speaks to this subject. Turns out it was written by Professor Patel. <laughs> so, uh, it seems to me that uh, while he may say, I have a bit of a vested interest in the outcome of this debate, and there's no doubt about that, think what would happen to the future of that article if this subject disappeared from the radar screen. <laughs> All of Professor Patel's research would simply go into a black hole. Um, but it is an interesting subject. Um, uh, and Stephen makes it a number of, of uh, points that I think deserve to be addressed. Uh, his first point is, um, you know, it's unnecessary for judges to return to practice. Now, when he makes that point, uh, he casts a quite narrow net around this notion of returning to practice, and basically he seems to describe it, as I understand it, as you can't go to court and you shouldn't be writing opinions or giving advice about cases that may go to court, because those two things seem to create some kind of appearance that concerns him. Um, that's a very narrow net, and if you said, how many judges are retiring to do just that? The number is negligible. Um, it is, just talking about my own experience, I have now been an ex-judge, returned to what I was before as a lawyer, uh, for 
six months. And I, I think I am doing what is typical of judges who retire from practice. I'm doing some mediating, I'm doing some arbitrating, I chair a board, I'm teaching at Osgood, uh, I'm chairing a task force, uh, not unlike a public inquiry at Queen's Park, and I am doing some advising of young lawyers at Palier Roland about their cases. Um, and it's really only that last category that I hear Stephen focusing on as something that causes him concern. Uh, but I don't think it's fair to say that there is, a, 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 there is a tidal wave of judicial retirements that is now proceeding back to court. Um, he recites Charlie Huband as an example uh, and, and says um, and the appearance that that creates is unfortunate for the justice system. Um, I suppose one could do surveys of what that has caused in the public mind. I suspect, if anything, my own sense, Stephen, is that if anybody has suffered as a result of what Charlie Huband has done, it's Charlie Huband. And I think if you travel the streets of, New of, of Winnipeg in judicial circles, you would find that that has been seen as a very left-footed action by a, by a former judge, not something that has cast aspersions on, on the strength, the, the principles, or the ethics of the judicial system uh, as a whole. Um, uh, Stevens uh, draws a lot of uh, support from the fact that Charlie is 4 and 0 oh in the Court of Appeal. Uh, I suppose if he were 1 and 3, it might be a different outcome. I don't think it turns really on how many he's won or lost. Uh, but I'm not sure that the public appearance of a judge going back to court is, is as serious as, as one would think. Um, uh, I confess I have no desire to do it. Uh, but to take an example that is um, an analogous, uh, I recently conducted a mediation and one of the lawyers for one of the sides was one of the most eminent former judges I know. Uh, and he was nothing but a positive contribution to, uh, uh, to, to a case that uh, we succeeded in settling. If you say to me, does that cast any aspersion on uh, the sitting judiciary or the justice system as a, as a whole, I can't imagine it. Uh, so that's my own immediate experience with a, 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 a retired judge coming close to fitting in that very narrow window that Stephen has described as what he advocates as being offside. Um, uh, so I don't think there's much in the public appearance argument. First of all, I don't think it carries much in terms of empirical evidence of happening. And secondly, I think when it happens, I don't think it's significant. The second argument he makes is that uh, somehow judges trade or former judges trade on their status. Um, frankly, all lawyers trade on their status. There's nothing a lawyer loves more than finding him or herself in LexisNexis as one of the hundred greatest lawyers between 23 and 24. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, that's seen as a badge that you wear. Uh, and you are who you are. Uh, and so it does seem to me that the notion of trading on one's status is to accuse former judges of doing something that everybody else in life does and that we all accept as what is necessary if somebody's going to go on with their lives. Uh, you folks out there are within a year or two of trading on your status as, as young lawyers. Uh, you know, what, that's who you are. You can't get away from that. So it does seem to me that again, the, the, the use of one's status as a retired judge is a straw man. Um, he talks about <coughs> private suspicion. That is what happens behind the closed doors of a law firm when a retired judge has an open door and a young lawyer comes in and says, I have a case and I'd like to talk to you about it. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that uh, if judges are permitted to teach, uh, as they are, and as I did, uh, talking to a young lawyer about, about the legal issues in their case is very little different from a judge talking to a law school class about what they, uh, what they say the law is about in a particular area. Uh, the one thing that I agree with Stephen on, and I, let me be nonpartisan for a moment, is I think there is, there is a tricky issue involved about the use of private knowledge. 
Okay, I do think that's that, that's an issue that is worth us all paying attention to. Uh, that is, how how is it that judges are going to be um, uh, advised of norms that try to avoid the use of private knowledge? Now, some of that private knowledge, I suspect, is absolutely useless. Uh, I've known Ian Benny for 40 years. I've litigated against him. I, I've argued with him. Um, I've had my cases reviewed by him. And if you said to me, could I tell you what arguments appeal to we and Vinny? Not a chance. So, I mean, <laughs> anything I said about what might work with Ian isn't going to be worth the powder to blow it to hell. Uh, and I, I suspect that's true of a lot of what one would suggest is private suspicion. Okay? Uh, I mean, what do I think Rosie Abella is going to do about the next case involving Section 15? I sat with Rosie Abella. I've known her as long as I've known Ian. I can give a prediction. My prediction has no more chance of being right than your prediction having read her cases. Frankly, I suspect we'd both be right. Okay? So I don't think there's much going for the notion of private suspicion. Um, finally, there is the, the point Stephen makes about, about somehow uh, this invades judicial neutrality. Uh, the, far, the fact that one can be um, uh, a neutral one day uh, and a partisan in a piece of litigation the next day. Um, I suspect that uh, what he ignores is the front end, the entrance to being a judge. You know, uh, one day you're an advocate, the next day you're a judge. I was appointed in the middle of an appeal. Okay, like literally in the middle of an appeal. It, it was an appeal to the federal court about the blood, the, 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 the blood problem that Canada had. And I finished making my submissions, fortunately. The case was not over, and um, I didn't show up the next day, and my junior carried on. So I went immediately from being a partisan to being a neutral. Now, I won't ask you to vote on whether I did that successfully or not, <laughs> but it, at the front end, it is inevitable. And if we cope with that, why should we not be able to cope with it at the back end? Uh, so it does seem to me that the system is stronger than Stephen makes it out to be, because we are successful in uh, seeing judicial neutrality while the, the individual is a judge, and, and uh, being prepared to accommodate what the, the individual did beforehand. And I think the fact that uh, the individual does similar things afterwards is neither here nor there. So um, let me give three advantages to uh, having no limit on this. Um, the first is, is my own, and the last two are, are borrowed from Rand Graham, uh, who uh, has thought more about this than I have, I confess, because he was going to sub for me if I hadn't been able to come today. Uh, the first is that um, judges can stay too long. Uh, you know, I was a judge for 18 years. I thought that was plenty long enough. And the experience of the court I, I, I was proud to be part of for, for that length of time was that the co that cohort really had, uh, which had worked so well together and were such close friends uh, for that period of time, was reaching its best before day. We all felt that. Uh, and people have coped with it in different ways. Three of us have done what I'd what I, I'm one of three who, who've gone back to practice, Dennis O'Connor and Bob Armstrong are the other two. Uh, a number of them have, have gone supernumerary, and uh, just to unpack this uh, unjustifiable perk that judges are allowed to have, that means that you work half the time and, and, and get paid what you were paid working for working full time. Uh, but you're really uncoupled from the institution in a, in a, in a, in, in a true functioning sense. Uh, so, and what, what that allows is for those who go supernumerary, uh, they can play golf, they can play bridge. Uh, anybody who's seen me play golf would know that that was not the least bit enticing to me. Uh, but judges do that uh, when they go supernumerary. Um, but it allows the institution to renew itself. Uh, and I think that's a very healthy thing. Uh, I think it's a very healthy thing to allow people to come into the system uh, and to serve their turn as judges, to be stewards of the judiciary for a period of time, and then to move out of it. 
And so to encourage that, I would make it easier rather than harder for judges to leave. And that takes me to Rand's two, uh, two points that I think are by far the most potent. Uh, and that is um, judges going back to practice uh, uh, creates an income stream. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the alternative for a retired judge to create a parallel income stream would be to write a judicial memoir. And if I said to you, which is worse? For the public <laughs> is it a judge going back to practice or writing a judicial memoir? It ain't close. And then Rand's final argument, which seemed to me to be one that's appropriate to end with, is there is absolutely no more socially desirable uh, uh, principle in today's world than the notion of recycling. Going back to practice is simply that. So for me, going back to practice promotes the, the public interest and should not be regulated in any way. <laughs> so I'll say just a, a few things by way of uh, response to that. This, this, Stephen suggests that given because we can cope with the partisanship neutrality switch on the front end, which he himself admits is inevitable, we have to draw our judges from somewhere, that that somehow means we should, where we have a choice not to do it, do it on the back end as well. Right? And that second thing does not follow from the first. We have to do it on the front end. We don't have to reinforce that problem on the back end. But we can accommodate it both places. Well, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I, if, if we have choice, it seems to me we should exercise that choice in favor of the due and proper administration of things. Uh, he suggests that all lawyers trade on their status, which is of course true, but all lawyers don't have a status that comes from having held high public office, right? conferred through and by the state and by the administration of justice. So of course all lawyers trade on their status. That's not an answer to, to this question. Um, the fact that char poor Charlie Huband is himself suffering with a negative reputation as a result of this process, that doesn't mean the system isn't also suffering. And I do accept, to be fair, I do accept um, Stephen's point that uh, th his record is not the issue. I would be equally perturbed if we're losing a lot of his cases. Because um, again, it's the perception that the clients have that one side, uh, something is happening that would be different. Like, I suppose we were losing all those cases, his own clients might start thinking, your colleagues really hate you, don't they? Yeah. Right? I mean, why, why are you still appearing in front of these people who really can't handle you? Your judgment's that bad. <laughs> right. And, and the final point, I, it's, he's such a good friend. Stephen makes the very careful point that, that my academic career will suffer having labored over this article if somehow I win this debate. So let me, let me get this straight. If I win this debate, the article is totally vindicated and held up as the seminal publication that led to this change. And he's worried about He thinks I would be worried about that? I'd be delighted. Thank you.